regular is in um, air quotes here. <laughs> Today is Thursday, November 4th. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency, some board rules have been temporarily altered. Today's meeting is our first hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when you're not speaking and when you're presenting, make sure that your mic is unmuted and your camera is on. For those who are appearing in person, please wear your face covering while in the building. And if you are presenting, please state your name before responding to questions for those who are listening remotely. Commissioners may have a motion on the consent calendar. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Do I need to take a roll call vote still? Apparently, yes. Marina, it's kind of nice. We're used to it now. <laughs> Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony, not for board deliberation. When it is your turn to speak, I will call your name and unmute you or call you to the presenter's table. I will set a timer for three minutes when you begin speaking and announce when your time is up by saying time, at which point, um, please wrap up your sentence. When you're done with your sentence, I will place you back on mute. Madam Chair, we received um, nine, um, nine submissions for public testimony. Let me just make sure. Uh, actually, yeah, nine. Um, our first testimony is from Andrea Kozel. Um, trying to see if they're on here. I'm not seeing her. Let me find the next person. Um, so, um, Kelly Peterson. Kelly, I'm going to unmute you. Kelly, can you hear us? We are not hearing Kelly that well. Um, so, so for some we're time. having a uh, Kelly. You are you are our first <laughs> ever speaker in our virtual uh, slash hybrid board meeting. So if you can just remain patient for a few minutes, the audio is not that great, and we want to be able to hear you. Um, um, Kelly, can you try saying something again? Okay, can we try again, please? Sorry, Kelly, can you uh, repeat yourself? One more time, please. The audio maybe needs to be turned up on just this computer. Sometimes it's up.
All right, can we try one more test? <laughs> I mean, I think we can we can go. Yeah, go for it. Is someone's um, volume on? My volume. I'm sorry. Hold just one more minute. Uh, on like one of the, is there like a machine? Can you hear sound coming from your computer? Okay. Yeah, I That's echoey. Uh, no, you should just be hearing them from overhead. Okay. Sorry, oh. Kelly. Pre you are winning the Patience of the Year Award today. Um, you and everyone else who signed up and everyone who's here in the audience. Thank you. Kelly, I'm just going to mute you for a second. Um, I'm going to check with Emily real quick. This is just not being ingested and sent out. Um, yeah, it is. Not hearing anything from the right. Um, Brian Smith, can we test your audio? If you're there. Um, Jessica Berry, are you are you there? Can we test your uh, audio real quick? Yes, we can hear you better. She's coming over the TV though. It's coming from the TV. Yeah. Yeah. But it shouldn't be even be coming over that TV. Executive decision and say we go for just a few more minutes and then if we can't do it we'll go upstairs to our offices and go online because I uh, and tests later right yeah I would say at this point I don't know that we're going to be able to solve this on Perfect. the fly so we're going to pause our meeting. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break, and the commissioners will go upstairs to our offices, and we will go back to virtual for one last time. This we're <laughs> going to get it. We're going to be <laughs> so. We will see you back in five minutes in virtual land. Thank. You.
No, there's for whatever oh, reason. Hello, Chekafori. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, hello, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Hello again, everyone. Hello, Commissioner Stegman. Hello. Marina, if we're if we have a quorum, I'd like to get started so that we can um, yes. our presenters who've been waiting for public comment can can go. Yes, I will resume the recording um, and we are ready to go. Great, thank you. Um, thanks again, everyone. This is Deborah Kafour, your Multnomah County Chair, and I just want to appreciate you all as we uh had our first venture dipped our little toe into the water of going back to somewhat normal we're pausing that for now and going back to the virtual but we will try it again next week so uh, marina if we could continue with public comment i think kelly peterson was was awaiting to chat with us yes kelly you're unmuted and um we should hopefully hear you now oh great so you can hear me yes okay oh, great thank you so, thank you so much um, thank you, Chair Kafori and Commission members. My name is Kelly Peterson. I'm the Oregon State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, I'm a native Oregonian and have lived in Portland nearly all my life. And I'm here today on behalf of HSUS and the over 200 Multnomah County residents who have signed a letter urging your support for an ordinance to prohibit the sales of puppies and kittens in pet stores while still allowing and encouraging stores to host adoption events with local shelters and rescues. And we know that Portland is a city of pet lovers, continually ranking at the top of reports for the most friendly city in the country, uh, with Bend falling a little bit behind. And so much so that rescue dogs are often flown to Portland as part of the second chance programs affiliated with countless shelters and rescues here in Oregon. And it's why we're asking you to consider enacting an ordinance that is reflective of Multnomah County's humane values and that ensures puppies from puppy mills or backyard breeders are not sold in local pet stores. Um, the proposed ordinance language that is submitted is designed to support existing Multnomah County pet supply stores and in fact, there's currently only one business in Multnomah County that occasionally sells puppies and kittens. And it's also why seven of the leading pet supply stores in Multnomah County have also uh, submitted a joint letter that we uh, attached in our comments that support an ordinance and that would really ensure that future businesses also adhere to a humane business model. And as well, um, the proposed ordinance, it, will not affect responsible breeders. In fact, most breed clubs consider it a violation of their code of ethics to sell their puppies at pet stores. And as well, the AKC itself states that it's important for the public um, to visit a breeder's home, to see at least one of the parents, to make sure the site is clean and that the dogs are healthy. And that isn't possible if a puppy is sold in a pet store. And the reality is that as more states and localities prohibit pet stores from selling puppies and kittens, Oregon and the Portland area would be a logical place for a store to open up on the West Coast. And that's because over 400 municipalities across the country, including the city of Boise, as well as the five states, um, including our neighboring states, Washington and California, have enacted similar pet store laws. And that's really why now is the right time to consider an ordinance. And, and lastly, I wanted to mention that also included in our comments is a letter in support signed by veterinarians throughout Oregon and primarily in Portland. So thank you 
for your consideration and your time and your patience this morning. And we do look forward to having Multnomah County continue to serve as a leader in Oregon by passing an ordinance that is consistent with our county's humane values. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you for your patience this morning. Take care. The next uh, speaker we have is Kate Merrill. Business Association for Portland Central East Side, the Central East Side Industrial Council, and our Enhanced Services District, Central East Side together. This past Monday, I watched the live press conference going on under, under the Hawthorne Bridge, which is just two blocks away from our off office. The announcement that the city and county are coming together to offer more shelter and outreach options, more aid to people living on our streets, and more mental health resources gave us real hope for the future. It's been more than two years uh, since the Central East Side formed the Enhanced Services District Central East Side together. Multnomah County was one of our major district employers, is one of our major district employers, and has been a supporter since its inception. So, City Council passed the ESD in February 2019. It's about, it was about the first in 20 years uh, in Portland. And we started services district-wide in October 2019. In 2020 and 2021, our teams responded to over 5,000 safety and cleaning dispatches, and our Safety for All teams have had over 30,000 interactions with businesses, visitors, and residents, housed and unhoused. We've, had, we've started peer work programs for unhoused to clean trash off of our roadways and to restore our bioswales. We've been offering crucial aid to unhoused by connecting them with medical and health appointments, hygiene supplies, food and clothing, and shelter lists. We are seeing a steady increase in demand for our safety services from both housed and unhoused and have increased our safety hours to nearly 24 hour coverage. Despite our successes, we're facing significant challenges. In August and September, we had 10 fires reported to us that were suspected arsons, mostly the burning of people's camps. Our unarmed safety teams have been witnessing increased violence on our streets and getting an emergency mental health response has been very difficult. Two Central East Side businesses and a mentor, member of our Safety for All team um, have come today to share their stories during public comment. What has become glaringly clear is that our city is ill-equipped to help individuals during mental health crises and with behavioral health issues with the urgency and the consistency that they deserve. Project Respond, like many mental health providers these days, need greater staff capacity, and they can take between 30 minutes to an hour to respond to major situations. This is often too late. In Portland, Central City, Old Town, and Central East Side have been, both been acutely affected by Portland's growing behavioral health crisis, and we ask that the county dedicate more behavioral health services to Central East Side. Just in the past month, our safety responded to 28 mental health crises. We need help finding solutions for repeat assailants who are falling through the cracks of our mental health system. Many of you received a letter from property manager Brooke Kabatik back in Ju July explaining all the violent behavior that they've encountered in, encountered in the area near Grand and Stark. Kabatik and many of the businesses Time. in the area, including one you'll hear from today, I've spent many years trying to get a repeat assailant into mental health treatment after she wandered into traffic on Grand and punched or threatened passerbys on a daily basis. So thank you uh, Thanks, for listening Kate. today and thank you. Thank you so much for the interview. Uh, next we have uh, David uh, Sunman. David, go ahead. Thank you and good morning commissioners and thank you for allowing us this time to share with you. Uh, my name is David Sunman and I serve as executive director of City Team Portland. I'm here on behalf of the CEIC. I serve on the sidewalk oversight committee and I join my neighbors here to urge you to take immediate action to make our city safer for businesses, employees, and local residents, ensuring that mental health and outreach support services are consistently available in our area, which is the Central East Side, prioritizing sustainable, equitable systems for addressing behavioral health issues on our streets. City Team is located on the Central East Side on Southeast Grand Avenue. We have 11 on site employees with additional support services off site, and we are a rescue mission organization, which is actually an extension of what was once called Penile Mission which was opened in 1904, the oldest rescue mission in the city of Portland. 
Last year, we served 70,000 hot meals, offered 16,000 nights of emergency shelter, and housed and supported 70 men struggling with substance abuse disorder and residential life transformation programs, among other programs and services that we offer here in our area. I'm also a graduate of City Team's Renew program, having been houseless and severely addicted to heroin and meth myself until I showed up to City Team in 2015. So I've seen firsthand what it takes to radically transform the life of an individual who is struggling, and this work is very important to me personally. There's a term that I hear frequently when neighbors describe the situation in our area, which is lawlessness. But behind that, as we know, are people, men and women with names and unique stories who are suffering from severe mental health disorders, but who then repeatedly commit violent crimes with no arrest or civil commitment. Dustin Rowdy is a recent example. I know him. He's a young man in his 20s. For months, he camped behind our building and came to us for food. I once called emergency responders and sat on the ground with him when he collapsed in front of our building, having a drug induced seizure. But I know at least 3 women, their names are Brooke, Erica and Emma, all employees of local businesses who have been physically assaulted by him. 2 of them right across the street from our building. Uh, 1 of those is Brooke Kabatic, the property manager across the street. And after each attack, he was back within the hour. And we are told simply that there's nothing more that we can do to keep him away from those who he has just assaulted or to get him the help that he desperately needs. We have residents in our building who are coming off the streets and turning their lives around, getting clean from life controlling substances, gaining employment and serving the community. But they are frequently put in situations where they are assaulted themselves and the emotional distress that this has caused clients to leave our program and return to drug use. Since I took on this role last year, we have gone through a complete staffing turnover. Every single employee who worked for us as of summer 2020 chose to leave because the burden was too great. And we rely so heavily on the Central East Side Together Safety for All team. Without them, I don't know what we would do. Our goal is not to call overburdened PPD to respond to mental health crises, and the non-emergency responders on average cannot respond until hours later. So the Safety for All team is vital in our area, but they cannot do it alone. The need is too great. And this isn't just an old town problem. We see the same issues from the same individuals who go back and forth from downtown to Central East Side. So please, we are asking that you would extend behavioral you. health services to our area as well. Thank you. Thanks, we appreciate you. Thanks for coming. So we have Tiffany Barr. Tiffany, go ahead. Hi there, thank you commissioners and those in attendance. My name is Tiffany Barr. I'm the care coordinator with Central East Side Together Safety for All team. I lead a small outreach team working with the houseless community in the Central East Side Industrial District. Working with the community at a street level provider has demanded I draw from every facet of my work and training in mental health, chemical dependency treatment, forensic behavioral evaluation, and housing case management. This is a diverse population and each person deserves to be seen and understood as an individual. But given three minutes to tell you what I think this community needs, I can say they need more safe people. People who can be there in a steady and consistent way and are able and willing to walk with them through all the stages of change for as long as it takes to make this incredibly complex and difficult transition to living indoors and living in a way that allows them to be safe for themselves and the people around them. Outreach teams like ours that are present for both daily community engagement and respond effectively in times of crisis are able to build the trust necessary to facilitate healthy discussions about change that can evolve into steps, actions, treatment, and recovery. Throughout the year I've spent as care coordinator for this team, I've seen terrible failures of our system in addressing those with the most need. I have seen women and children denied shelter beds immediately following domestic assaults. I have been told someone is not a fit for therapy for the exact reasons they are so desperately in need of it. I have seen overworked and underpaid therapists quit and leave caseloads of houseless clients waiting months for a replacement. I've seen traumatized humans gain the courage to open up only to be told that they must wait three months for an intake appointment and told they had to wait another three months when they missed that appointment because they their phone ran out of battery or they had nowhere to charge it. I've seen people housed after waiting years on a list only to fight against a crushing loneliness that results from a lack of preparation and missing services that could have provided support and continuity of care. I've seen people leave shelter to return to their home outside with friends that can provide comfort, but not safety, because humans can live for a time without safety, but th they can't live without companionship of some kind. These are the stories that we can prevent with effective care before, during, and after transition off the streets. 
Our team has facilitated countless Zoom sessions over our phones between clients on the street and local behavioral health providers. We talk to people while they wait. We make sure people remember and we fight for people when they are underserved. But we can't fight to get someone a service that isn't there and there aren't enough behavioral health services to meet the needs of folks with co-occurring disorders in our community. I urge you to create more in reach and day treatment programs for those with severe and persistent mental illness and, and co-occurring substance use problems. Add funding to behavioral health providers, increase crisis response and community outreach, and streamline service coordination. Our team will continue to support and connect people to these services as they grow to meet the need of this valuable I'm and vulnerable population. Thank you for your time and all your effort. I'm grateful to be a part of this discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming this morning. Our next speaker is Michelle uh, Schwegman. Uh, Michelle, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience as a business owner in the Central East Side. My name is Michelle Schwegman, and my husband and I started our store Herbivore 19 years ago, right here in Southeast Portland. We've been at the corner of 12th and Stark for the past 15 years. We are experiencing an unsustainable number of traumatizing situations lately. For example, this Tuesday, November 2nd, my store manager was charged at by Dustin, the person that was mentioned earlier, who has been a recurring challenge for us and all of the surrounding businesses. As she was attempting to enter our building in the parking lot, he charged at her shouting and throwing items that he had just removed from our compost bin. She was able to get inside and pull the door shut before he reached her. Because she was able to get inside, the police said that nothing could be done. On November 1st, myself, an employee and a customer were forced to lock ourselves in my store for 20 minutes while we waited for the Central East Side officer to arrive to help assist us with a different person who was in crisis in the doorway. Then I personally escorted my customer out through our back door to a lift that she had called so that she could safely get away. During the week of October 22nd, I called the CEIC every single day at least two times to help us with Dustin. He has been harassing us and our customers off and on for the past four years. He yells at us, calls us names, makes menacing faces at us through our windows, knocks and pounds on the glass, screams at people who walk by, asks us for money or food, and then berates people who don't give him what he wants. He throws things at us, he sleeps in the doorway, leaves needles and garbage everywhere. Last week, we had to remove the benches that we had installed years prior for our customers. And we did this to discourage Dustin and others from laying on them all day and harassing and berating people who walked past. Over the past month alone, I've had three different individuals sleeping in my doorway in the morning. It is difficult to get them to wait or to leave, so I call CEIC for help. Often there are needles, bloody rags, and drug paraphernalia left behind. In September, a man with a sword was walking up and down the sidewalk shouting that he was going to kill people, so we called CEIC. In August, a man entered my store and approached our counter with his genitals exposed, fondling himself. With the help of a customer, we got him to leave, and then he went next door to see and did the same thing, and then we all called CEIC. In 2020, the first part, um, 2021, we had a houseless person living there. The entire block was taken up. These are just a few examples of our daily battles in the Central East Side. And we are all struggling, our businesses, our employees, and yes, the people that are suffering from addiction and mental health challenges and who don't have homes. I'm sorry. But our neighborhood is desperate for more help. We are so grateful for the CEIC and the people that they employ and train and because they are the only people that are helping us. Their stamina and care is remarkable, and we need more people like them. But the tools they have are not enough. We need housing, treatment, counseling, and other assistance programs to get to the root of these problems. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is Storm Large. Storm, you are unmuted. Oh, wait. There we go. You're unmuted now. Go ahead. Hello, Storm, are you there? Oh, maybe, let's see. Storm, can you, does this one can work? Can you hear better? me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Hi, excellent. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. My name is Storm Large. I'm a musician, author, activist, and I've been a Portland resident for 20 years. 
And I've been a huge advocate for decriminalizing sex work as I am a huge fan of touch, connection, love, and humanity. Thank you all so much for allowing me a few minutes of your time this morning. Um, I am here to ask that you support defunding of decoy stings and sex buyer diversion programs. Consenting adults engaging in a mutually beneficial exchange are not the same as coerced or trafficked victims. And we all want to stop human trafficking and protect children. However, treating adults seeking human touch from other adults, treating them the same as traffickers, it does not help the real victims. It just creates a more dangerous environment for sex workers. It punishes the wrong people and wastes the valuable resources meant to protect the real victims. Reactive sex, touch, intimacy, in exchange for money as trafficking, it harms the consenting adults way more than it helps. Uh, and there's tons of research, personal, medical, and legal around this fact. You've probably been supplied with some. There are brilliant people at the forefront of this research who are more than willing to share their findings. It's pretty mind blowing. And another well researched and scientifically proven fact, a fact heavily field tested and time proven by myself and most every single soul I know, is human beings need touch. We need contact. I know I'm not blowing your mind here or telling you something that you don't already know, but we need the comfort of others. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's isolation is kind of the cruelest thing to do to a human. You know, friends, family, lovers, partners, community, and of course the physical contact isn't always sexual in nature, but sex is absolutely a big part of that equation. But I realize sex is touchy. I know pun is totally intended. It's taboo, it's dirty, it's infamous, it's not to be spoken of. Huge chunks of this country have zero decent sex education for young people because the thinking is it'll make kids wanna have sex. And sex education, that's a topic for another time, but in essence, I get it. For so many, it's personal, it's private, it's touchy. And believe me, I would so love to give you all a banging two minute zinger of a testimony that heals all the shame and fear and hang up so many have around sex, sexuality, and especially sex work. But I mean, remember it wasn't long ago, Oregonians got over their hangups and fears around cannabis, and now weed dispensaries are considered essential businesses. But we know sex is still a highly charged subject and we cannot fix that here. However, we can at least fix or eliminate the laws that punish the wrong people and waste the resources intended to help the real victims. So please reserve the trafficking budget and manpower for actual traffickers and support the defunding of these decoy stings and sex buyer diversion programs. Thank you so much. Next time I'll sing. <laughs> We're gonna hold you to that. Thank you, Storm. Next, we have uh, Vera Layton. Uh, Vera, go ahead. Hello. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Oregon Sex Workers Commission. I'm asking for your support to defund the prosecution of clients through the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, as well as um, the diversion programs through the District Attorney's Office. My name is Vera. Um, I have lived and worked in Oregon, Portland, Oregon specifically for nine years. I have been a sex worker for three of those years. Um, I also am trained as a trauma informed sex coach through the International Professional Surrogates Association. So I regularly see the harm that she, <clears throat> excuse me, that shame does to someone's mind, body and heart. People seeking sex work are seeking companionship just like you or I. Only they may face barriers such as disability, shyness, aging, or busy work schedules that make it difficult to connect with potential partners. Sex work, sex work allows clients the possibility of enjoying the company of another person. The desire for companionship, care, and sex is normal, but because some people pay for those experiences, we punish them in the name of trafficked people. It begs the question, who are we helping when we punish the clients of sex workers? Does prosecuting clients and forcing them into a diversion program that teaches sexual shame benefit sex workers, trafficked people, or clients? From where I stand, I see this industry being uh, driven further underground, making it more dangerous for all three parties. Sex workers are forced into more clandestine exchanges with clients. Clients face the fear of arrest and sexual shaming at their own expense for simply seeking out sex in exchange for money with a consenting adult. And trafficked people are not receiving direct resources to help them out of their situation. If the county wants to help trafficked people, the money being used to prosecute clients and fund the sex buyer accountability and diversion program would be put to better use in programs that directly support trafficked people, such as housing and job resources and therapeutic support. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming this morning. Our next speaker is um, Kate Marquez. Uh, Kate, you yes. are unmuted. Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good morning. My name is Kate Marquez. I'm a native Oregonian and a former sex worker. When I was a young single mom, I put myself through college and supported my young family by working at a massage parlor where I worked alongside mostly immigrant women in very similar circumstances to those recently murdered in Atlanta. Like them, almost all were mothers in the support of their families. I'm here to implore you to cease funding for the DA's diversion program and prostitution decoy stings. I believe that the best thing for sex workers and for our communities is decriminalization of sex work. When I talk to people about decrim, we often discover halfway into the conversation that we're talking about completely different things. The confusion is about the term sex trafficking. What is sex trafficking? Some people assert that all sex workers are trafficked, that adults who choose to do sex work as their best alternative, as I did, are unbeknownst to themselves, in fact, trafficked. Of course, most people choose all work as a way to escape poverty, to make money. You can say the same of mine workers or line cooks or Uber drivers. Are they trafficked? Should they be arrested? Because of the pervasive confusion about the term trafficking, I urge you, if and when you converse with someone about sex work or about sex trafficking, to make explicit what you mean and what they mean and who you are talking about. See if you are in fact talking about approximately the same thing. Do you and the person you are talking to draw a distinction between what is forced and what is chosen? Everyone wants to know what's the best way to address sex trafficking. Well, every major human rights organization and the ACLU support decriminalization of adult consensual sex work because it is the best way to combat sex trafficking and violence against sex workers. Simply put, it is, as you might imagine, far, far easier to identify abuses and to enforce the laws against those abuses in a decriminalized environment where standard labor laws apply and the people working there feel free to report abuses. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. That is the last of our testimony. Um, should I go on to R1? Yes, please. Um, and just real quick, the captioner on the call, we're not seeing the captions coming through. Um, if you could um, troubleshoot that. Um, R1, informational board briefing on COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning, public health team. Good morning. Um, in keeping with our um, technical problems this morning, my laptop's not working, so Debbie Powers and I are sharing a laptop here in the Multnomah building and we are masked. Good morning, Jessica Guernsey. Public Health Director, I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm joined by um, Debbie Powers, um, who's sitting a safe distance from me, our primary care clinical deputy director. So we will be sharing a screen today. Next slide. So we're here today to talk a little bit about our standard um, data updates. So I'll walk through what we're seeing in terms of cases, hospitalizations, um, and positivity. And um, then we're going to transition to the big news about um, our vaccine pivoting um, and what's going on with uh, pediatric vaccines, which I'm sure you all have seen all over the news. Next slide. So um, you all are familiar with um, these data slides. Um, this is our uh, epi curve, as we call it, for Multnomah County that gives us the total cases reported to public health each week and um, compares um, our um, white population to the BIPOC population. Um, so you can see we are still experiencing what we've described as a bumpy plateau. So we've been a little bit up and down on the downward trend, but we are continuing to move down from our highest peak. But as you can see from the last reported week 1024, we did jump up a little in our um, positivity uh, rate. So um, we are continuing to see um, you know, a concerning level of cases, but we are on a downward trend. 
Um, our positivity um, comparatively, um, we did see a jump in the Latinx population and the black African American population in terms of our positivity. And we're watching that very carefully vis a vis our hospitalizations as well as our uptake in vaccinations. Next slide, please. And then this is just another view um, of our positivity, um, our positivity rate. Um, same information, just from a different view. Um, you can see here again that rocky plateau that we um, have been seeing. Um, we're dipping back down under 5%. Um, what we're hoping we'll see that continued trend. Um, if you all recall that between 5 and 10% positivity is sort of the red zone that we consider um, high concern. Um, so we're hoping to continue to move down. Next slide. And then um, finally, in our standard data slides, this is our hospitalization breakout um, by race ethnicity. Uh, so you can see here um, sort of the same pattern, more or less. Um, we're watching some of these numbers really carefully. Um, we came to you a few weeks ago, talked a little bit about um, the blue bar that you can see in there, American Indian, Alaska Native were concerned about those numbers. Um, those have gone up a little in terms of hospitalizations. Um, so we're continuing to work with community partners, our communicable disease team, again, focusing much of our efforts on uh, low barrier testing and uh, immunization efforts to close those gaps. Next slide. Do you want me to stop here, Chair Kofori, or do you want me to go on with vaccines? How do you go on with the vaccine updates? Thanks. Okay. Next slide. Um, so we have a few slides here uh, from the state Tableau dashboard and Commissioner Vega Peterson. I think this is I think this is the second time we added the additional slides that you asked for um, that give us uh, a better look at race ethnicity. So this is just our general slide for the entire Multnomah County. And just remember, this is um, all all vaccination, not just public health or our FQHC system. So this is combined um, for the entire county. So here you can see that we've got close to six hundred thousand. Um, folks with at least one dose of um, any of the vaccines available, obviously on the higher end of completion of vaccine with over 552,000 and 40,000 um, in progress. Next slide. So these are just the raw numbers by race ethnicity, which aren't particularly helpful just looking at the raw numbers. So we'll come to another slide um, that has the actual percentages we can go over. But this gives the breakdown um, based on uh, Multnomah County population for um, using the rarest race uh, um, calculation. Next slide. This is what we see overall in Oregon in terms of um, vaccination rates by race ethnicity. So you can see that um, it's broken down on the left um, in a bar graph uh, by race ethnicity in terms of the number of dose, the series complete, and then the extra dose. Um, so uh, this is the percentages for all of Oregon, 98.1% for um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, 73.1% for Asian, um, one point, I can't quite read that. It's, oh, I think that says 71 or I can't quite read the orange number on my screen, um, but I will be able to give you the, the Multnomah County numbers. I can see those more clearly. 60.6 uh, for Black African American African immigrant, 56.2 for Hispanic Latinx, and 53.7 for American Indian Alaskan Native. Next slide. So this is just some of those numbers um, continued. Um, this gives us the total of um, 18 years and older remaining to reach that 80% vaccination benchmark um, for all race ethnicities. Um, so this, the, the far left column is the current week seven day running average people that are initiating a vaccine series by race ethnicity. And then the um, column closer in is the previous week seven day running average people initiating. So that's the exact count for how many people are initiating vaccination by race ethnicity. Next slide. And then this gives us the um, entire state's county breakdown. So if you um, go to the bottom, fourth from the bottom, you'll see Multnomah County um, percent of population vaccinated with at least one dose by region and using the rarest race and ethnicity formula. 
So for Multnomah County, we um, see about 99% of Hawaiian Pacific Islander, 70.4% uh, um, Asian, 76.6% for white non-Hispanic, 63.1% for Black African American African immigrant, 65.9% for American um, Alaskan, excuse me, Amer American Indian Alaskan Native, and 58.6 for um, Latinx communities. Next slide, please. And then this is just another view of that same data that breaks out um, race ethnicity by um, percentage one dose percentage series completed, and then percentage extra dose. So again, generally following the patterns that I just described um, for county specific data. Jessica, can you pause for a moment, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Myron has a question. Thanks so much, Chair, and thank you, Jessica. I just have a clarif clarifying question, um, and this might be a given, but, uh, when we talk about the percentage, that's the percentage of people that are eligible to be vaccinated or percentage of the population in general. Eligible. Thank you. Thought so. But. Commissioner Vega Peterson, do you have a question? I don't. I just appreciate the additional slides and have taken some screen captures to, to take these. So thanks so much. And Commissioner Stegman? No questions. Thank you, chair. All right, Jessica, keep going. And these are all available on the OHA COVID-19 data website. So they're updated frequently. So you can download daily updates um, from their Tableau dashboard. Next slide, please. So just in summary for the public health vaccination clinics, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then our um, pivot work. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Debbie Powers. So this, again, is just an overview of the volume of work that we've been doing um, in the public health clinics. Um, we've received um, close to 167,000 total of all three vaccine types. Um, about 143,000 have been redistributed to other sites through partner agencies for mostly culturally specific community-based um, events. Um, we've held uh, over 350 clinics just in public health, um, 150 of them with a BIPOC focus. Um, for our community. And then looking at percentage wise in terms of the individuals we're serving, about 67% of the public health vaccinations have been given to BIPOC individuals through all of our clinic settings. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about our pivot. Yay, in terms of pediatric vaccinations. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview and then I'll turn it over to Debbie. Next slide. So, as I am sure you've heard um, all over the news, um, we are moving into this next phase of this very, very long um, event with COVID-19. Um, the Pfizer vaccine has received emergency use authorization for ages 5 to 11. Um, the dose um, is the dose for this age group is one third of the dosage of the vaccine for older adolescents and adults. Um, children are not small adults. Um, so the both the dose and the method in which we are working with children is going to be different than teens and adults. Um, according to the manufacturer and what we've heard from all of the um, research and advisory groups um, in participants ages 5 to 11 years of age, this vaccine was safe and well tolerated and it showed robust neutralizing antibody response for those that it was tested on. Um, Pfizer has a strong track record of effective and safe and safe vaccines. So we have confidence. Um, in this vaccine. Um, we are going to start to see local rollout begin this week. Um, I am pleased to report that based on the pediatric summit yesterday, um, excuse me, Tuesday with um, health share, the healthcare systems, FEMA, pharmacies, um, LPHAs that, um, you know, starkly different from our initial rollout of vaccine, there will be multiple access points coming online over the next few weeks for um, children ages 5 to 11. So we will see um, many access points, which is obviously very different from what we saw initially with um, the COVID vaccine that was rolled out to adults. Um, so right now, um, things are looking extremely positive with the access points that we will have 
in um, not only Multnomah County, but the tri-county area. And these will obviously include pediatricians, primary care health care systems, including our FQHC, which Debbie's going to talk about in a minute. Um, pharmacies have been approved to vaccinate all the way down to age three. Um, we are expecting to see um, at least one high volume FEMA site in Multnomah County in East County is the location that's being discussed. Um, and we're very excited about that for the first push of the COVID vaccines and we'll have more details on that soon. Just want to bring that to your attention. And then, of course, we will be doing um, pediatric vaccination clinics and public health. Both through standing clinics, um, we're going to be uh, utilizing two of our WIC clinics um, in Northeast and our gateway site um, on Burnside um, in outer eastern Portland. Um, and we will be holding consistent sites. We're going to we're going to launch those dates if, um, in the next week. Um, we're pivoting our staff uh, right now. As you know, we're um, going to be ramping down Fabric Depot um, in the next uh, week. And we will be pivoting to the WIC clinics to provide um, COVID vaccination. Um, one thing that I just wanted to mention for the public health sites is we are going to also be focusing on bringing children um, back up to speed on their regular school vaccinations, which is a unique um, footprint for public health because we know we have um, about uh, 2,000 more children uh, this uh, coming February, which is when we do school exclusion, that actually need to be up to date on their vaccinations. So we'll be integrating um, those vaccinations into our um, pediatric COVID sites. Uh, we also we will continue to maintain our um, our sites at ERCO and Latino Network, both for low barrier community testing, as well as adult vaccinations. And we'll be watching the pediatric vaccination access really carefully, and seeing if we need to um, further integrate some of this work into other existing vaccination work. Um, as I mentioned, the operations that are needed to vaccinate children are quite different than adults. Um, so we need to have rooms that we can bring children into. Um, so some of the sites that we have are amenable to that and some of them are not. So we're continuing to watch that and work um, on integrating uh, those um, aspects of the pediatric vaccine. And then lastly, um, we um, are going to be really pivoting to strong community engagement um, with culturally specific CBOs, our own community partnership unit, our REACH program, schools, um, to really respond to what we're hearing from folks about having lots of questions and needs for information from trusted sources um, regarding the pediatric vaccine. We expect this to be a longer vaccination period um, for the pediatric vaccinations. Folks have lots of questions that they want to get answered, which is completely understandable. So a big part of what you'll be seeing um, from us in public health is standing up those same community engagement opportunities, opportunities we did early on with the COVID-19 vaccine, but probably a little bit more in depth. Um, we're really hearing from community partners that this is going to be needed. Next slide. Now I'm going to turn this computer over to Debbie. Literally turning it over to Debbie. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. So um, I am sharing some information about our primary care health centers. We've got nine student health centers that administer pediatric vaccinations and um, will be responding to our five plus community. Uh, a, so where you see adults listed here in this slide, that really is in reference to like parents that would come in with their kids, but it is not, um, uh, these are largely pediatric um, vaccination opportunities. Then we've got uh, six of our seven primary care health centers that are administering both adult and pediatric vaccinations through their medical visits. And then we've got um, mini visits many um, clinics, which are largely like second dose clinics. Um, are, uh, we will have seven of seven very soon. We're just quite short of staff. Um, our HIV Health Services Center administers COVID vaccination to our adult population. Uh, seven of our, we have seven pharmacies, but our pharmacies are not ready to vaccinate quite yet. We have two pharmacies that will be vaccinating soon. 
And actually this slide is incorrect. We're using Moderna. So this is gonna be of our adult population. And the intention there is because we're largely um, using Pfizer vaccine, we wanted to have some places where we could still offer um, Moderna if that were the choice. And then we have seven dental clinics. Our dental clinics are not hosting uh, vaccine opportunities, but vaccination opportunities, but they do join in staffing to support primary care programming in many clinics. And our clients are um, able to get vaccination through both medical and dental um, vaccine clinics that are offered at our health centers. Next slide, please. Okay. And then we've got some what we consider pop up events. These are events that are just specifically targeted for a certain population. And in anticipating we'd have that five plus approval, we um, planned our pediatric events accordingly. So we've got some ev two events coming up David Douglas, and that's an evening event, 3 30. This, this is, should actually be 7 30 on November 22nd and 13. There'll be information on our website. And then Reynolds Middle School, 3.30 to 7.30, um, November 17th and December 8th. And those will, those will host about 500 um, vaccinations each. Yeah. Next slide, please. And, um, you know, we're still running primary care clinics as, as is everybody else. So when we have these pop-up clinics, of course, it's all hands on deck. Deck. We've got our pediatric events staffed by our student health center staff, primary care, dental staff, pharmacy staff will come, and um, of course, leadership and coordinators. So it's everybody coming together to ensure that those pop ups are um, well supported. Next slide, please. And um, we had joined public health and had a number of uh, centralized events. We had Fabric Depot days, Arbor Lodge days, and East County days where we had um, vaccine, larger vaccine clinics, standalone clinics. But now we're just normalizing bringing vaccines back home, right? You're vaccinating in your primary care centers and um, just like you do flu vaccine or any other vaccine. So um, our, our clinics in this last month, in the month of October, began vaccinating on site. And except for the one who, as I mentioned, was short staff, that's Rockwood, and we'll see that in the coming weeks. And um, you know, we're we're excited to have the opportunity to be here for community for our, our clients and community. We are recognized as a place where vaccinations are normally administered, and by we, I mean all of our primary care health centers in community. Um, opportunities to have you've got opportunities to have discussion with your medical provider, the team, and of course, a community health worker. And we'll have the ask the pharmacist initiative so that um, if it just happens to be that you are just picking up a prescription and have a question, um, you've got somebody who's ready to have a, a great conversation with you about vaccination. And that, that's really the goal. Next slide, please. So thus far um, with our vaccination efforts, we're looking at having had a um, 65%, about a 65% um, rate of our Bible community that had attended these vaccination events and had become vaccinated. Next slide, please. And we have, as of yet, about a 38% rate of those needing um, interpreted visits. And that's what we would normally we'd expect to see in primary care somewhere around there. So that that lines up accordingly. And that's what we're here for. Next slide, please. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, board, do you have questions or comments for either of our um, presenters this morning? We'll start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jessica and Debbie. This is great. I appreciate the additional slides on race and ethnicity and really excited to see the vaccine events in East County. Uh, I don't have any questions. Appreciate the report out. Commissioner Vega Peterson. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Jessica and Debbie. Um, I have one question. Did you, on the slide where you're talking about the pop-up events, did you have the location in David Douglas where that's going to take place? The location in terms of address or where? Yeah, just like if it's going to be at the high school or one of the David Douglas schools, I'm just curious. Oh, yes, yes, that's the high school. High school, okay. Great. Sorry, sure. didn't catch that. Yes, the high school and Reynolds was the middle school. My apologies. Okay. Reynolds middle school specifically. And then the pediatric doses um, are smaller, but you still need the two doses. So we're gonna is the plan to keep these running like for like I don't know how long are we gonna be keeping the clinics open? Basically, do we have a plan yet, or is it just gonna be indefinitely? You know, so that we can get people through the the full um, series of vaccinations. Thank you for that question. So the pop up events, there's 2 events and so there's actually 4 dates because you've got your 1st and your 2nd, but um, we have ongoing vaccination in, at our student health centers. So it's um, 4 hours. So each each student health center hosts a vaccination event, um, which is 4 hours per day. I'm hoping that I'm saying this right and that's listed on our website. So um, each day a week. So five days a week, there should be, there is, there, there will be, there is now and will continue to be um, vaccinations for four hours each day. And you, by going on the website, could see which clinic is happening on which day of the week. Okay, thanks so much. And just to really appreciate the way that public health is um, getting people in for COVID vaccines, but also recognizing the need to, to really extend all options for all of the pediatric va vaccines that people may have fallen behind on. So I just really appreciate this work. And I always appreciate the focus on our BIPOC communities who, who need, you know, additional um, avenues to get to get access to these shots. So I appreciate that. And then just wanted to say that Kaiser is now, um, you can make an appointment for Kaiser to get your kiddo vaccinated. If you're a Kaiser person, I was able to do that this morning for my son, which was a really happy thing. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jessica and Debbie. Um, I actually, I want to go back to. I think this would be a question for Jessica 1st, which is just around the. Um, the um, sort of the incentives for the, you know, the gift cards that had been passed out in different uh, contexts, getting people vaccinated. I've been. I've been hearing a lot of questions from community and some of the clinics about those. And um, I think the first is the safety question. I've heard some anecdotes, you know, it's anecdotes, but um, about people getting, you know, coming in and getting multiple uh, vaccinations and getting multiple gift cards. Is there a safety issue if people are getting multiple vaccinations? Do, is, is that something that we should be concerned about? Well, we always want to make sure that people are getting the right, um, if for a vaccine, the right vaccine at the right time, and we're not over to vaccinating people. We have sev several um, processes in place to do our best to prevent that, including a workflow that obviously looks at um, alert. Um, we recently instituted an identification process um, across our vaccination sites, which is actually the exact same process as um, our F2HC system, which allows for multiple forms of ID, not just a picture ID or driver's license. Um, and the goal is to, um, to weed out um, any duplicate uh, vaccinations. Um, that being said, um, I'm sure I don't need to say this, but if somebody wants to work around something, um, they can, um, but we do have, um, workflows in place where we can uh, do our best to check alert to make sure that they're um, not being over vaccinated. Someone um, will not be turned away for um, it's really, as you're pointing out, there are issues with the gift cards. As you know, we're going to be um, uh, stopping that uh, November 13th is our last date that we'll be um, utilizing the gift cards at the public health clinics. Um, so, you know, part of that is is related to making sure that we are not over vaccinating people. That's okay. Thanks. Um, and that response to the question about the approach, but I, I am cur I'm just curious whether there are 
health implication? I mean, I, I don't know the answer to this question. If there are health implications from getting, obviously we want to do the right vaccinations and the right number <laughs> at the right time, but are there health implications for getting over vaccinated, I guess? Um, well, like I said, I mean, and I can have Dr. Loeffler Lauf circle back with you or Dr. Vines okay. around the specifics yeah. related to yeah. this, but okay. um, we definitely don't want to be giving people, um, we don't want to be over vaccinating people regardless of what, you know, the documented science says right now. Um, I think it's it's not real strong. Obviously, we're doing third doses and boosters um, for, you know, people currently. Um, which sort of answers some of that, but uh, obviously we don't want to be give, we don't want to be giving excessive vaccinations. Okay, but I can I can have yeah. one of the health officers follow up with you. That would be I would love that. Thank you. Um, and and then I just had a question to clarify. Um, I think I just missed it. So for Debbie. Uh, had mentioned the um, there was a 38% number for people needing um, interpretation uh, interpreters during their visits. What was what was the 38% number? I'm sorry, I just missed um, it. Thank you for that. So those would be um, of those needing interpretation, and so we had use of iPads at that time. And in clinic, we have. Um, you know, telephonic interpretation, and at some point, hopefully soon, we'll have in-person interpretation again, but we were looking at a 38% usage of interpreters. Okay, but not a not a 38% rate of vaccination among people who used interpreters. Does that make sense? Could you say that one more time? Yeah, and like, um, so that it's not that 38 per like that we have, you know, we want to get to whatever 70% and over if people get um, vaccinated and uh, it's not 38% of people who have used interpreters um, are vaccinated, like of people needing interpreters. It's not that 38% of those are vaccinated. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Got Thank it. You. Absolutely correct. Just, of those that we had okay. vaccinated, it was a 38%. Got it. Okay. Needing okay. interpret having that, utilized interpret needing and utilizing interpret interpreters. Wow. And that that is just so huge and um you know is is so so important and speaks for the need to be just making um uh, interpreters available in as many different languages as possible. Um, do we have a system like, uh, I know in the hospital that I work in, we have, it's like a video, so you just bring the thing into the room and it's like a little TV where the person's face comes on and you can choose any language you want and it's, you know, certified interpreters and it really makes the person feel very comfortable who you're working with. Do we have that? We um, we do, but it's used for um, sign language right now, and that just has to do with kind of contracts and availability. But that is that is I ideally where we're going if we can't. I mean, okay. Our ideal state is having that in person interpreter, but um, we do have the iPad, so could we could do that, and we do that in a limited amount right now. Um, okay, it's a goal. But I would love to talk more about that. Yeah, so, absolutely. I will say that you. not everybody had an interpreter. We have um, language KSAs on our positions, and we tried to be very intentional about having um, staff available who spoke Spanish, who speak Spanish, and who could. Um, so we didn't have to bring an interpreter at a 38% rate. I don't want to actually, I, I'm realizing that may have sounded like we had that much interpretation. Okay. Our, um, that was the need, and we had staff who spoke multiple languages. And then had interpretation for those that we didn't, we just didn't cover. Got it. Super helpful. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Jessica. Have a lovely rest of your day and we will move on to R2. Thanks, Marina. R2, approval of IGA with City of Fairview for continued collaboration on development of Fairview Parkway and Halsey Roundabout. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R2. Morning, Jessica. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Kafori, Commissioners. I'm Jessica Berry. 
I'm the Transportation Planning and Development Manager, and I use she, her pronouns. The item before you is to approve an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Fairview to, uh, ident to outline the roles and responsibilities for the planning and design of a roundabout at the intersection of Northeast Halsey and Northeast Fairview Parkway in the City of Fairview. Both Fairview Parkway and Halsey are county-maintained roads that are in the City of Fairview. The reason this is coming to you as an IGA is that it's currently, the project is currently not in the city's transportation system plan, nor is it in the county's capital improvement plan, which means it's kind of functioning outside of our normal process for working together on a project. While it's not yet in their TSP or our plan, it was identified as part of, as a project in the Main Streets on Halsey plan, which was endorsed by the county and the cities of Fairview, Troutdale, and Wood Village in April, 2018. Since that time, the City of Fairview identified funding and has begun work on design of a roundabout at the intersection. In order for county staff to keep working on it, the county wanted to have an agreement with the city about how we proceed. Um, it is also important um, to have this intergovernmental agreement because we're in a unique situation of allowing the city to do some of the design work for a project that will ultimately be a county asset. This agreement allows us to ensure that the city does the design work in a manner that we can accept and which does not cost the county additional funding to support. So overall, the county is supportive of the project and the city's efforts to move it forward. Data show that roundabouts are safer and lower cost in the long run, and we appreciate the city's collaboration on the project. Um, so the IGA is just to formalize this agreement and our relationship with them. Um, and then they are they are beginning the process of incorporating it into their transportation system plan so that we can put it in our capital plan. Um, but we just want to get out ahead of the, the relationships and the working together. So with that, I will take any questions you might have. Thanks, Jessica. Marina, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, questions, comments, Commissioner Myron? No questions or comments. I love roundabouts. Thank you, Jessica. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. No questions. Commissioner Stegman. Uh, no questions, just a couple of comments. I really want to thank uh, City of Fairview for their partnership. And surprisingly, I've learned a lot about roundabouts. And sometimes people think that they actually slow traffic, uh, but they actually increase uh, the flow of traffic and are safer. So uh, I'm really excited about the work and the fact that uh, the three cities in East County are collaborating so well together and that Multnomah County uh, can play a role in that. Thank you for your great work, Jessica. All right, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The IGA is approved. Thank you. And we will now recess as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and convene as the Public Contract Review Board. May I have a motion? Oh, our oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, you're right. I'm going to read that. R3, R3, R3 sole no. source 24 hour emergency vet services. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds. Approval of R3. Good morning, Brian and Wade. Good morning, Chair Kapori and Commissioners. Um, Brian, if you're okay with it, I'll take the lead and then you can call in any questions. Please. Go along. Uh, uh, thank you for having us today. My name is Wade Sadler. I'm the director of animal services. It's good to see you all again. Um, uh, animal services is here before you today requesting from the public contract review board uh, a sole source exemption with our current provider, Dove Lewis Emergency Animal Hospital, to provide uh, 24 hour services uh, in conjunction with animal services uh, for a period of 24 months or two years. Uh, currently, Animal Services is contracted with Dove Lewis, and essentially what the contract provides is a place for um, both Good Samaritans to uh, drop off animals when they find them, uh, if they're sick or injured, or they suspect them of being sick or injured. Um, if they're closer to Dove Lewis than where we are located in Troutdale, since Dove Lewis is in the city center of Portland, um, sometimes it's much more convenient, and especially in the case of a sick or injured animal, it can make a difference in the, the outcome uh, for that pet. Um, so it allows them to drop them off, but more importantly, it allows care uh, for animals after hours. So uh, animal services 
uh, operates seven days a week. Um, but uh, after uh, about uh, 5 p.m. or 5.30, we close typically, and uh, it's much more challenging for clients to get to us. And we want to still have a source for animals to go to. Um, and that not only includes just for animals that are found, but it also supports animals for our after hour services for a place for them to go if they need immediate care or animals that are found by other government agencies like uh, Portland Police, Gresham Police uh, and Fire and Rescue Departments uh, as they're responding to calls uh, in the middle of the night uh, when we don't typically provide those services. And what Doug Lewis provides is basic stabilizing care for those animals. They you know, administer pain medication to treat any wounds or injuries. Um, and uh, and then tr get them ready to transfer to us for our own staff veterinarians to care as soon as possible, which is typically either same day or the very next the next morning if it's an overnight event. Um, uh, that's a short version of, of what we're hoping to accomplish. Uh, we've been doing this work with Doubles for several years now. Um, uh, typically, we would do a normal uh, request for procurement, but in this case, due to the effects of the the pandemic, um, most 24 hour emergency hospitals have severely restricted their hours. And what we've discovered is that at this point within our uh, county and our service area, Dove Lewis is the only emergency animal hospital providing that 24 7 care. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Wait, Brian, did you have any prepared comments or? Um, um, I yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, and I, um, Chair and, and Board. I'm, my name is Brian Smith. I'm the county's purchasing manager. And just to back up what uh, Wade had said, and um, when a sole source exemption comes before the board, there is um, a posting requirement. So we had this posted on our website for um, about nine days and received no comments um, or protests from anybody. So um, uh, I urge you to support this. Thank you. Uh, Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, commissioners, uh, questions or comments? Commissioner Stegman? Uh, thank you, Wade. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we all know how hard it is, especially, I don't know if anybody's tried to make a veterinarian appointment right now, but it's crazy. Uh, so I'm so grateful that we have access to Dove Lewis. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Wade and Brian, for um, presenting this. I know it's usually unusual when we do this, but this seems like a pretty clear case of there just not being any other um, options available, unfortunately. And I concur with um, Commissioner Stegman. My, the fact that we had been using for years and years is no longer using doing well animal care. They're just doing emergency care. So we had to find a new vet. So it is it is difficult out there. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Uh, thank you, Wade, and thank you, Brian. Uh, no questions or comments. Thank you both. Well, I will say since three of us, it sounds like at least have had difficulties finding vet care lately for our beloved friends, um, that this is uh, <laughs> comes as no surprise to us. There is a vet shortage. In fact, I saw a billboard. We're hiring a veterinarian, so it's, it's a thing. Um, thank you so much for your work on this and for keeping our furry friends and others safe and healthy. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kofori? Aye. The sole source exemption is approved. Thank you. And now we will recess as the Public Contract Review Board and reconvene as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. R4, Multnomah County 2021 redistricting. redistricting. So Good morning. Oh, oh, it's not a vote, it's just a briefing. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yep, we sure can. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Jennifer McGuirk. I'm the County Auditor. I use she, her pronouns. I'm here to talk with you and the public about an opportunity to participate in 2021 Commissioner District Redistricting. Next slide, please. So, as you know, in Multnomah County, some of our elected officials are elected on a countywide basis. And then we have our four commissioners who are elected to represent the districts in which they live. Next slide, please. 
This kind of representation reflects the value that our county government has of ensuring people have fair, equal representation. The county charter supports this by requiring my office to assess the population in each district every 10 years after the U.S. Census. Next slide, please. My office is required to determine if the population of any commissioner district is 103% or more than the population of any other. As shown on this slide, District 1 is currently 109% larger than District 3, and District 2 is 103% larger than District 3. This means that my office has to conduct redistricting. Charter requires us to do this in consultation with the Elections Division and to prepare a plan for you in which no district is more than 102% of the population of any other. We're also required to retain the general geographic characteristics of the districts. I wanna take a brief moment to recognize Mark Ulanowitz, the principal auditor in my office who's been leading this effort, Mandy Hood, my constituent relations specialist for her out outreach work, and Ben Harper, the county GIS specialist who's been building all of our maps throughout this process. I also appreciate the technical assistance we've received from the county attorney's office. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in August, my office started a campaign in earnest to inform the public that county commission districting, redistricting would be happening. We have an ongoing social media campaign, and this slide shows an example of one of our posts. We've talked about redistricting in the monthly newsletter. We've conducted outreach via email to a wide variety of community groups, including culturally specific groups serving BIPOC communities. We recently met with members of a coalition representing BIPOC organizations and leaders to learn about their redistricting ideas. I've appreciated the leadership of this board in helping boost my office's messages about redistricting and county communications has also been very helpful in sending out news releases, doing social media, and uh, they've helped us garner some media coverage as well. Next slide, please. On October 15th, we ended a months long process where people could share comments about existing boundaries we should try not to impact and communities we should try not to divide. We had feedback forms online and at all library branches in English, Russian, Somali, simplified Chinese, Spanish, and Vietnamese. I want to thank the library district and their staff at every branch for having our redistricting feedback forms on site. We received 48 feedback forms. When most people talked about their identities, they did so in terms of their neighborhoods, and the majority of comments we received were also about keeping areas together, such as neighborhoods that should stay in one district and keeping East County cities in one district. Next slide, please. Now we have another way for people to weigh in on commissioner district boundaries. Based on the guidelines and county charter, a directive from the Secretary of State, input from county elections, and community input, we've developed a draft map. People have through November 19th to review the map and comment, and I want to invite everyone in our county to check out the map and share their thoughts. Just a brief reminder that my office's task is so focused solely on commissioner district boundaries. We aren't able to adjust any other boundaries within the county, such as school district boundaries. And um, some people will see their commissioner change under the proposed draft plan because of those population increases I talked about earlier. We have a web page, and the link uh, will be shown later on a different slide, where people can click on an interactive map and go down to their address level and see what district they'll be in. Uh, people can look at different layers including uh, looking at demographics, proposed congressional and state districts. They can look at the current boundaries and compare them to the new boundaries that we're proposing. We also, on the website, you can read text descriptions of the current and proposed changes, as well as view a static map, like what's shown on this slide, uh, that quickly provides an overview of what the changes will be. We look forward to getting community input that can help us adjust boundaries if county charter allows so that we can support the county's diverse communities of interest. Next slide, please. After the public comment period ends on November 19th, we will finalize the proposed uh, commissioner district boundaries. 
and we will get a draft plan or get a plan to you, pardon me, in December. Your task then is to review and accept the plan and alter boundaries via ordinance. Next slide, please. People can access the map and related information using the URL on this screen. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor McGuirk. Um, well, I know that, that while the lines didn't change or your proposed lines didn't change drastically, for some of us, they did, meaning me. And I will say that um, it's a good thing I'm no longer the District 1 Commissioner because I, after this, if it goes through, I will be residing in District 3. So, um, interesting, a big change for me and all of my neighbors in, over on the southeast uh, corner of our community. Yes, you're not alone in that shift. Um, District 1 just grew so much more than we anticipated. You were left with some uh, challenging options. Well, I think it looks good so far. So congratulations to your team and thank you to Mark for all of your work on this uh, and Mandy as well. Uh, questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Myron? Thank you. Um, yes, we'll miss you in District 1. Uh, um, but, uh, thank you, uh, auditor McGuirk and also to Mark and Mandy for all the, all the work that has gone into this. Um, I had, I did have 1 question and, um, I appreciate your pointing out in the library, the opportunity to provide feedback, um, in, you know, in different languages. Uh, I'm curious about the outreach itself and. Um, you know, how the extent to which that has been um, an effort has been made to reach uh, diverse populations using different languages. Um, really uh, get to historically marginalized uh, populations BIPOC community and a geographically diverse population. Yes, so. Uh... The feedback forms were available on a variety of languages you mentioned. People can continue to provide feedback in that same uh, number of languages. We've done uh, social media posts in the six uh, key languages that I talked about, English, Russian, Somali, Vietnamese, Spanish, and simplified Chinese. Uh, we've done outreach to a variety of uh, providers and community groups that serve BIPOC and uh, communities, including immigrant communities, where English might not be their preferred language. Uh, we've done uh, some tabling uh, in areas that are uh, have a variety of different uh, BIPOC communities in them, such as uh, the Rosewood Initiative, one of their Saturday celebrations we tabled. Uh, we tabled at a Troutdale First Friday. And um, as I mentioned, we've met with a coalition representing different BIPOC communities and um, we'll be meeting with them again as well. So um, it's a challenge with my very limited uh, discretionary budget to do as much outreach as we would like, but we really have made an effort to try to reach out in a variety of languages and to um, reach out to community groups that know those communities well and know best how to communicate with them. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're very welcome. No further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, um, Auditor McGurk, for the presentation and to your team for all of the work that they've done, all of the outreach that they've done, as well as the work that the um, community engagement and the Office of Community Engagement has also. I know that they've been helpful with this with some of the outreach that you were just describing about to um, answer Commissioner Myron's question. Um, I really, I think having the outreach in all the areas, including our libraries is really great. That's where we're, um, you know, that's where we can get people engaged in this. I also saw some really good media coverage um, this week about the, the district changes. So that that's great that we're getting the um, um, word out that way as well. And um, I'll just have to say, Chair Kafori, I um, will, am honored to potentially be your new county commissioner. Um, welcome to district three. It's, it's really great over here. Uh, so, so that's exciting. Um, I have had, um, you know, this is mainly an auditor's, um, you know, responsibility. Obviously, it comes to the board um, 
when you release your report, and I know it's 45 days, and I, I may have missed this when you said this, but what do you think the timing is of getting the report to us? I'm just curious about like when we're going to be um, the you know approximate time when we're going to be voting on the new districts. Yes, our goal is to get it to you next month. Okay. So there are pieces of the report that describe the process we went through that we can write now. And so I know Mark's been working on that. And then we'll finalize the report after we receive all the public comments and make any adjustments we can to the map. Uh, my understanding is that um, uh, the chair's chief of staff, Kim Milton, is working with um, Andy in my office to find a uh, space in your December agenda uh, calendar so that we can uh, present at a board briefing and then um, assuming it goes well, have a vote uh, on the uh, on the revised map. Thank you for that. And then um, the only other thing I would add is I know I've had some conversations about, um, you know, people who are interested in, in really like looking at this as an opportunity to to do something different or, you know, even looking at different districts. But I know a lot of the work that your office has done is really dictated by what's in the charter and what's required in the charter and very specifically like adhering as closely as possible to the existing district boundaries. Um, so I do think that it's an opportunity as we're doing this redistricting and then as we're getting the county charter commission up and running to, to really engage in a really thoughtful conversation about what can we do to make sure that as we go through redistricting process in the future that it is as as equitable, as expansive, as, you know, really, um, I think, thoughtful and inclusive and really reflecting our values as possible. So, um, so I think that's a great opportunity that we have this time around. Yes, I definitely agree. It's, it's nice that the two um, processes are aligned right now. And I have let the Office of Community Involvement know that I'd be happy to talk with the Charter Review Committee about issues that we came up against. Uh, people have asked if we can add districts, we're not allowed to do that. As you mentioned, we're pretty limited, but I'm happy to serve as a, a resource to the Charter Review Committee as they move through that process and, and consider what really needs to, to happen in the future. Well, well, thanks again for all your work on this. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Auditor McWork. I really appreciate you and uh, your team's work. Uh, thank you, Mark and Mandy, and of course the Office of uh, Community. Um, involvement. Uh, so I just have to go back. Uh, I, I don't know if, it, if it's if, if it's trauma, but if we did do the census work and I did want to call out and shout out my team, Adam Bristow, who's no longer with the county and Leanna Mori, who is still uh, in on my team. And those two worked so hard. And as we know, the results of the census uh, really uh, are informing so much all of our districting uh, at every level throughout the state and uh, throughout the country as well. So uh, I don't really have any other questions, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of foundational work that has got us where we are today. And I'm so appreciative of uh, you, you making sure auditor that, that, that the districts are fair and that they're in the, in the correct percentages. Uh, and so I just wanna appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, um... Yeah, I was remiss in not talking about the amazing work that went on to get a complete count because without that redistricting, you know, it's never perfect. We're never going to have 100% of a perfect count for the census, but it would be a lot less accurate than it is. And we had a really phenomenal response rate to the census because of all the work that you led with our community partners and other levels of government. So um, that really was the main public participation effort that leads to redistricting is people participating in the census. So thank you for raising that. Good teamwork. Thank you, Auditor. Yeah, I was going to say it's a team effort. All right. All around everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auditor. We will see you next month while we get to uh, stamp for approval on all the great work that you've done. Thanks. Thank you. R5, proclamation recognizing the observance of Veterans Day on November 11th, 2021 in Multnomah County, Oregon. Summit. Second. second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R5. And Commissioner Myron, you are up first. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I am so uh, happy to be bringing forward this proclamation today 
as we all know, Veterans Day is next week on Thursday, November 11th, but as it is a county holiday, we're recognizing the service of veterans in our community today. I have always appreciated and supported the contributions and sacrifices of veterans in our community, but as the liaison to the Veterans Task Force, I have just learned so much about the individuals who make up the incredibly diverse array of people who serve our country uh, along with their loved ones. Um, I have really loved serving as that liaison and the past year and a half has been more than a year and a half now during the COVID pandemic has been, has been challenging in terms of coordinating, uh, faced many of the challenges that so many others have faced in terms of coordinating and the people who come to this group are so engaged with community and doing the work that it's, you know, it's sometimes difficult to connect there. But the, the last year and a half is all the more reason that we need to connect as a community and elevate and celebrate the contributions of veterans and other military involved individuals. So we have several presenters who will share personal stories about what Veterans Day means to them and the work that they do to support veterans in our community. I will now hand it off to our first speaker, Fleetwood Mosey. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Kafori and commissioners for having us here today. And thank you, Commissioner Myron for introducing the proclamation. For the record, my name is Fleetwood. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And I serve Multnomah County as a veteran service officer in the Aging, Disability, and Veteran Services Division. I have three fellow panelists today, Becky Lilly, who serves as the chair of the Veteran Employee Resource Group, Tobias Shea, a veteran who works with Do Good Multnomah Veterans Shelter, and Sheila Balvin, our Veteran Services Program Supervisor, who will read the proclamation for us today. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, our team our community partners, and most of all, our veterans have demonstrated immense resolve, resilience, and grit. Whether we were collaborating with the state and federal VA to find creative solutions to continue service delivery, to meeting our clients in the field in full PPE, to have them sign their claims, socially distance, of course, we made it work. We would also not have had the success we have had without our incredible community partners, including corrections counselors, from the Multnomah County Jails, housing case managers, and other frontline workers who took and continue to take great strides to get their veterans in front of us and assist with the logistics of our new normal. It gives me a great deal of purpose to assist veterans in navigating complex VA systems and see them access the full extent and spectrum of their benefits. As veteran service officers, we are trained and accredited to practice Title 38 law and we do this for free as a public service. The work we do allows veterans to receive monthly compensation for injuries, accidents, incidents, or events that occurred in service that they are still dealing with residuals from today, as well as countless ancillary benefits, including housing assistance. Many of our veterans do not know that they are eligible for VA benefits. Many do not wanna seek those benefits because of their ingrained and selfless military mindset that tells them that fellow service members may need it more or that they should muscle through their physical and mental pain. What I want our veterans to know is that veteran benefits exist because of your service to our country. Service in the US military often comes with inherent wear and tear on the physical body and mind. We are here to support you once you are on the other side of service. This is one small way that we can honor you. To our veterans, we thank you for the sacrifice of your service. And I'll now hand it over to Becky Lilly. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, Becky, you're on mute. Sorry about technology. <laughs> Do you want to try to call in again and see if that works? Sometimes going back out and coming back in.
I will just say that we are all very patient and have grace for each other today as we have had many, many technical challenges today, but this was what happens. Would it make sense to move on to Tobias while she's coming back in? I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Fleetwood. All right. Tobias, do you want to take it away? Tobias, we can't hear you if you um, are on mute as well. Looks like Rebecca is back, so. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. And we can see you. Here we go. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you to the board and the commissioners for having me here today. Um, my name is Tobias Shea. I am the veteran wellness coordinator for Do Good Multnomah. I am a veteran myself. I served with the United States Army 82nd Airborne Division. And I'm also formerly a houseless veteran. Uh, so I've personally experienced the unpleasantness of houselessness, and I've also personally experienced the great support network that we have here in Portland for helping veterans get housed and also um, continue to thrive here in Portland. Uh, currently, I am a personal trainer and a fitness instructor, and I'm using a trauma-informed model with jujitsu and nutritional counseling to help veterans combat the effects of post-traumatic stress. Um, I'm very hopeful in this job as I see veterans who are taking the personal initiative to do the work that will help them continue to be successful in the communities in which they participate. Um, my overall goal in this role is to continue to help veterans overcome their challenges through discipline, uh, personal accountability, mental and physical development, and selfless service. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to work with Do Good and be able to um, support veterans as they're working through the, the hard process of getting housed and getting back on their feet. Um, I'm honored to participate in this veterans proclamation and I'm grateful to everyone here for the support that they offer veterans and grateful for the opportunity to speak as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming this morning. Becky, should we give it another chance shot? Um, Marina, do you have any tips for her or be... I, I sent you a chat. Um, in the email, uh, if you can just give me your phone number, I could probably just call you in. Uh, sorry, I <laughs> um, I, I got your phone number. I'm going to call it. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, Becky, we can hear you. I am so sorry for the difficulty. I'm, uh, as you can tell, out in the field working. Um, anyway, thank you, Chair Kafori and commissioners for allowing me to address you today. For the record, my name is Rebecca Lilly. 
I'm a compliance coordinator with Multnomah County Facilities and Property Management. I served honorably in the United States Navy, and today I'm the chair of VERG for Multnomah County, and that is the Veteran Employee Resource Group. VERG supports veterans, their families, and their supporters. It provides a safe place to talk and share our feelings. We have had a significant challenge this year for our group, and that has been how the United States military left Afghanistan. This event has struck many of our members extremely hard. Many of our veterans served during this conflict. But our veterans are resilient, and we are working through it. Veterans also honor the falling, missing, and imprisoned U.S. military men and women. An example of this is the Berg display of the fallen soldier table in the lobby of the Multnomah building. The fallen soldier table is part of a very solemn ceremony. It is meant to remind viewers of the fallen, missing, and imprisoned members. And I would like to um, share a poem that uh, talks about this table. The rose stands for the family with faith and love for those who serve. They're held with the highest respect for that's what they deserve. A yellow ribbon is for the loyalty waiting for those serving abroad as we pray that they are watched over and kept close to God. An inverted glass represents the fallen can no longer toast. They cannot be an honored guest or such a gracious host. A lemon wedge represents the bitter loss of the fallen soldier's life. The salt is put in place for all of the loved ones shedding tears, for the soldier is no longer present to help calm our fears. The candle stands tall for the blood that the soldiers shed. It holds a place of honor and represented in red. The empty chair symbolizes the missing comrades who it aren't here. It now, now it stands alone for the voice that we cannot hear. And that was written by John Nelson. I'd really um, ask that people take a few minutes and look at the table in the lobby of the Multnomah building. It's um, very moving. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for your patience as we got the technology worked out. It's good to hear good to hear your your words. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you again, Chair Kafori and commissioners for having us here today. And thank you, Commissioner Myron, for introducing the proclamation. For the record, my name is Sheila Weldon, and I am the program supervisor for Multnomah County's Veteran Services Office. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I will now read the proclamation recognizing the observance of Veterans Day on November 11, 2011, 2021, I'm sorry, in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds in 1954, Congress formally created Veterans Day to pay tribute to all American veterans and current service members, renaming Armistice Day, which had been celebrated as a legal federal holiday since 1938. Veterans Day is a time for Americans to honor every service member who has ever worn one of our nation's uniforms. Throughout our history, U.S. citizens and non-citizens have answered the call to duty and served our country with honor, dignity, and an instinct to serve. Many people throughout our country's history have served as members of the armed forces, active, reserve, and National Guard, including women, people of color, immigrants, people who identify with all sexual orientations and, agen and gender identities, people with disabilities, and other brave individuals. The diversity of veterans is a tremendous strength that makes our armed forces more resilient. Often these individuals were discriminated against by the government that they served. They served for the vision of equality 
even though that vision was not actualized in their own lives. Nationally, there are approximately 19.5 million veterans in the United States and 5.06 million veterans on disability compensation. Approximately 11% of veterans experience homelessness and 50% of veterans experiencing homelessness also live with a mental health illness like PTSD. We know that Multnomah County is a microcosm of our broader veteran community and their struggles. Multnomah County is a home to an estimated 40,224 veterans. Multnomah County is committed to providing the support and care that all veterans have earned, including improved access to employment, benefits, housing, and health care. In Multnomah County, we continue to work together greater, toward greater inclusivity and equity in how we support people who have served our country. We seek to better understand the needs of these individuals and communities to provide care for veterans at the full intersectionality of their lives and identity identities and to meet their needs as they transition back to civilian life. Multnomah County provides services to veterans who live in communities throughout the county. The county veteran services officers in the aging Depart disability and veteran services division of Department of County Human Services work directly with veterans and military connected families in an effort to ensure that they receive all state and federal benefits to which they are entitled to. Additionally, from the health department to the joint office of Home homeless services to the department of community justice and to all departments and programs in the county, veterans access services and support. Multnomah County is also committed to veterans represented in our workforce. The Multnomah County Veteran Employee Resource Group provides support and identifies resources for county employees who are veterans or are members of military connected families. The Multnomah County Veterans Task Force VTF was convened in 2010 by Commissioner Diane McKeel to evaluate and strengthen the services provided to military service members and veterans in Multnomah County. The VTF is still active today and continues to provide a collaborative forum for education, advocacy, and community among service providers and service users. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaims, in observance of Veterans Day on November 11, 2021, on this day, all veterans and current members of the Armed Forces, Active, Reserve, and National Guard will be remembered and honored in Multnomah County, Oregon, and with this proclamation affirms the county's commitment commitment to supporting veterans in our community. Thank you, Sheila, appreciate that. All right, uh, commissioners, questions, comments? Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Commissioner Myron, uh, for bringing this forth, really appreciate it. And also wanted to make a shout out to Commissioner Diane McKeel, who started the Vet Veterans Task Force. And of course, uh, our speakers today, thank you all for the work that you do to serve our veteran community. And oh my gosh, uh, Sh Sheila, when I walked into the, the Multnomah building today, the first thing I saw was that beautiful uh, table that, that was there. And uh, it was just really so touching and meaningful uh, to see in our lobby. So I, I just wanted to call that out. Uh, and to the over 40,000 veterans that live in Multnomah County, um, there just really aren't words. Uh, we owe you such a debt of gratitude uh, and really uh, just there's not anything I can say or do to convey uh, the sacrifices and the appreciation that we, that, that we appreciate about you. Um, I did want to let folks know that uh, this next Thursday uh, during Veterans Day, uh, Gresham, they always hold an event, uh, the Gresham United VFW BFW will be holding an event uh, at the Gresham Heroes Memorial. And many of you probably know that this is the 100th anniversary of the tomb of the um, soldier. And if uh, I know many of us have been there uh, at Arlington National Cemetery, and it is such a, a moving um, 
place to be uh, to reflect on all the sacrifices that our veterans have made. So thank you all so much for taking a moment to recognize the sacrifices that our veterans have made. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Commissioner Myron, for bringing this pro proclamation forward. I'm so glad we we're able to do it um, because we won't be meeting next week so people can observe Veterans Day in, um, in so many different ways. And I, I just want to thank all of you who presented today. Um, thank you um, so much, Fleetwood, for um, talking about how we're helping um, veterans access services and some of the challenges that that people feel internally, you know, about getting access to the services and the importance of having um, the outreach and somebody there who can understand those issues and really help um, get them the uh, the services and the programs that they that they deserve that they've earned. Right. And um, and I think that's um, such a really important point. And, you know, it really reminded me. Um, Becky, when you were talking about, I'm so glad we were able to hear you, um, when you were talking about, you know, the challenges that some of the, the uh, veteran employees are feeling right now because of the, the U.S. Um, leaving Afghanistan and how that went down and what's happening in that country right now. I mean, I think all of us are feeling that way, but to, to have served there is a, is, a, is a totally different experience and a totally different relationship with what's happening. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. And you know, and you talked about the resilience that that um, the veterans have for that, but I do think that like goes back to um, what Fleetwood was saying about you know also knowing that there's help there and that there are services and and things for people so that you don't have to be quite as resilient on your own. And I think having the um, having um, Berg be a, a place for people to go and to to find um, community there is why it's um, just one of the reasons why it's so important. Um, Tobias, thank you so much for um, all your work, your service that you're that you've um, done as a veteran, but also the service that you're doing now with Do Good Multnomah. It's such an amazing organization. They do so much work and are such an important partner for Multnomah County. So thank you so much um, for what you're doing and for bringing your your experience and your peer perspective as you're as you're working and continuing the outreach to to veterans here. Um, and then Sheila, thank you so much for reading the proclamation. It was a really powerful one. I always get to I always like to read through them as they're being read and um, just appreciate that. And, and like Commissioner Stegman said, you know, just so grateful to the over 40,000 veterans here in Multnomah County for the service um, that they've given um, to us. And, and um, you know, and I think it's really important for all of us to take the opportunity of Veterans Day to really think about the service and what it means and what people are fighting for as we're doing our work here within, you know, within the United States of what we want this country to be and how and what we want our role in the world to be. So that it's an opportunity to do that. So thanks everyone um, for your work and for um, this proclamation today. Commissioner Myron. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to just add my thanks to our presenters and Fleetwood. I really appreciated your talking about the uh, incredible work that you and the other VSOs do to get veterans the services that they need. Um, it is above and beyond the call of duty, um, especially during the, the call of duty and um, pun unintended, but the um, but especially during these challenging times and you created a very vivid picture of, you know, in full PPE and going out and meeting people where they're at. Um, and Tobias, I I too appreciate your sharing your story and um you know what what you've experienced and how you're paying it forward and the work that you're currently doing to help others move for, forward on their own paths toward housing stability and meaningful work and um just just so appreciate that um becky i'm so happy you were able to call in from the field um it was Great to hear from you and I too, as Commissioner Stegman mentioned, I saw the table this morning um, walking through the lobby at the Multnomah building and it was, you know, it was powerful just just seeing it, uh, but and, and I had not heard the poem and hearing that poem just really blew me away and so thank you uh, and I'm 
I'm going to have that in my mind when I go down and see the display again. And thank you for the work you do with the, the Verg. Uh, and then finally, Sh Sheila, thank you for the work that you do at the county and for reading the proclamation. There's always so much that I appreciate in the, uh, in the proclamation uh, that celebrates Veterans Day. And um, I remember, I don't know, a couple of years back where we really focused on the vast diversity of you know who who veterans are and the intersectionality of um identity as veterans with so many of the other identities people hold and so it's so essential we continue to elevate this and call it out and um I, it was beautiful in the proclamation so thanks to each of you and the over 40,000 people it's crazy um who have served their country uh, who live in Multnomah County. So an additional thank you to Aaron. So many thanks, so much gratitude, but to Aaron Grayheck, um, again, Sheila and my incredible constituent services manager and policy liaison, Tabitha, Tabitha Pitzer for, um, helping to coordinate this proclamation. Our lovely board clerk staff and county attorney's office who help make recognition like this possible. And I want to add my thanks uh, to former district Four commissioner, Diane McKeel, who's hopefully watching right now, who envisioned the veterans task force saw the incredible value and potential um, of uh, bringing veterans and service providers together to engage and share experiences and advocate um, and, and making this happen. So it's, it's great to be here celebrating with you today. Thank you. I'd also like to begin my time by expressing my sincere and profound gratitude for all uh, Multnomah County's veterans and actually all our veterans across our country for everything that they've done to serve this country. And thank you. Fleetwood, Rebecca, Tobias, and Sheila for being here today and for sharing your stories. I'm thankful that this proclamation acknowledges, honors, and celebrates veterans, and it gives us the chance to pause and reflect on the ideals that they've taken up, as well as the sacrifices so many have made. And there's a reason that we make this proclamation a priority every single year. And I just want to speak directly for a moment to the tens of thousands of veterans who make Multnomah County their home. The county is committed to supporting you and your needs, whether you transition back into civilian life years ago, or you're at the start of that often rocky journey, especially as we continue to wrestle with the pandemic. We are always going to work to ensure that Multnomah County is a place that honors our veterans with action, not just through words and proclamations. And I'm grateful for the work of our employees like Fleetwood and Sheila and their teams who make sure of that. Finally, I want to thank all the veterans who work at Multnomah County in any sort of capacity. Our organization is fortunate to have all of you as a part of our county family. We are better, stronger, and a more inclusive government because you are here. Thank you very much. And Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you all. Thank you very much. And that is the end of our agenda items for today. We do have time now for board comments on any non agenda items. And I'm going to call on commissioners uh, by district to see if anybody has anything. We will start with you, Commissioner Myron. Thank you. I know we're, we're not going to be here next week. So I was looking to see if there's anything next week, but um, I just wanted to mention the uh, daylight savings time, I guess is on the 7th. So everyone fall back. Um, also on that date uh, is the social change cup, which is uh, hosted by a super cool organization. It's um, Street Soccer USA, it's the Portland chapter, and they do, it's at um, Rose City Futsal East, and it's just this amazing group who bring um, people together 
uh, over a love. It's a nonprofit. It fights fights poverty, bringing together people over a mutual love of soccer. So, including houseless individuals. Um, but I was at this event, I think, two years ago, and it was, um, you know, there were thorns there, and it, it was. It's really cool. It's just um, sort of a tournament. And uh, if you're able to go, it's going to be on Sunday at 1255, the social change cup at uh, Rose City Futsal East. And I will have a constituent event in Old Town um, a week from then uh, on the 13th, actually, on Saturday, um, where we are going to be doing a walk through Old Town. I know we've heard from a lot of folks there recently, but there's some amazing cultural institutions we will visit and um, have an itinerary and it'll be really cool opportunity to um, engage with that neighborhood. So 10 a.m. Um, meeting at the Lansu Chinese Garden. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Becky Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to share, um, yes, because we are not meeting next Thursday. So on December 13th, which is a Saturday, I'm hosting the Constituent Coffee in Montevilla. So this is gonna be at Sebastiano Sicilian Deli, which is delicious food. Um, this is gonna be from 9.30 to 11 a.m. They have a great outdoor area that we're gonna be able to take advantage of. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to meet in person with folks. Um, over coffee and some pastries. Um, so I hope people will be able to join. You can RSVP for the event. It's tinyurl.com slash no, it's like NOV JVP coffee. So November JVP coffee, NOV JVP coffee at tiny URL. Um, so please join. It's going to be um, a great day and it's covered in case it does happen to rain on that day. Thank you. Commissioner Segment. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to remind folks that we are holding our virtual issue form today at 3 p.m. I'm really excited. We're going to be talking about resilience hubs and the possibility of having one in East County. We may be able to combine what is called a resilience hub, which is basically a standalone building that would have a solar microgrid ability. Uh, we know that when the, the power grid goes down, we experienced, um, you know, the extreme heat event, uh, and then we also have winter events. And so looking at how we might be able to combine an East County service site with a resilience hub is really, really exciting. Uh, so if you all can join us, uh, it's at 3 p.m. You can find information on my website and on my Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to remind folks that due to next week's um, board meeting, regular scheduled board meeting falling on uh, a holiday, Veterans Day. We are going to have our board meeting instead on Tuesday, November the 9th. So Tuesday, November the 9th at 9 a.m. we will be here um, back in action, working for the people of Multnomah County. Thank you all. Have a uh, lovely rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy.